Welcome, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bob Derso, one of the co-founders and senior directors of the Galansky Institute. It's really our pleasure to conduct these types of workshops. We're all very, very excited that you're here. We're very eager to get to work. I'd like to thank Kathleen Schneider for offering her beautiful space. Um, you'll get to know Tristan very well. He's our videographer. <laughs> um, so we are, we're taping the entire weekend. Look around, these are the people you're spending your weekend with. <laughs> They're all very nice people. Um, so I, I wanted to say a bit about uh, what's going to happen. So tonight I'm going to talk, but it's not just me talking. I want it to be very interactive. So as questions come up for you, please ask them. Okay, so there's no need to hold back. Um, if you want to come up to the piano at any time and experience something I'm talking about, I want you to have all of that freedom. So it's a little bit more of that kind of workshop than just strictly me standing up here with fancy TVs talking to you, okay? Uh, I want you to talk to me also, okay? The commitment really in this, in this particular workshop is to really um, give you, first of all, give you information that can help in your teaching. Okay, but also if you have certain things that you are uh, challenged by in your teaching and it, com it comes up during the time here, please ask. Like if I'm describing something and you say, you know, I have trouble getting a student to, to do that. It's a very great question because if you have that trouble, undoubtedly somebody else might, you know. In addition to that, all the things we're talking about apply to your own personal playing. You know, I always realized that when um, I would bring somebody to Mrs. Talman or I'd bring somebody to, to Edna and they would make a correction, I would go home and I would think, hmm, mine is not that perfect either. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's one of those situations that the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree. So sometimes if you're missing certain things in a student, it might not be completely clear in your own hand, you know? So it's a very good chance to clarify anything for yourself. So I just wanted to give you that openness to just ask any question at any time. You know, just um, raise your hand and we'll, we'll deal with it. Okay, so um, if we look at um, what we'll cover tonight, I, I made a kind of outline, okay? so. It's really learning and teaching the Talbot work effectively with an emphasis on turning in one piece. Now the importance of turning in one piece is pretty important because the whole foundation gets built upon the ability to be a unit, the finger, hand, and arm, and turn in one piece. And when I thought about the topic, I thought to myself, oh, you know, we'll, we'll cover that in about 15 minutes, you know, turning in one piece. And then I made this, this is a nine-page document <laughs> on turning in one piece. So I'm very eager to get to work here because I really realized how much more complicated and how much more information we really have to funnel into this issue. In other words, um, the more you can catch in, this early, in the earlier stages, the easier the whole progression of the technique will go for you all. So it's usually, it's really an interesting phenomenon is that most things can be traced back to some very basic thing that is either not done successfully or not combined well or likewise. So what I realized very quickly and have known but put into tangible words is that turning in one piece cannot exist in a vacuum. So we can't just turn in one piece because it depends on a lot of things. So we will examine the factors involved in producing an excellent rotational movement with the finger, hand, and forearm. It sounds very simple, but we'll see how this evolves. As, as we talk about it, you might think about things that maybe hadn't occurred to you as relevant to turning in one piece. And those are the things you want to store. So I thought what we will cover tonight is a framework for observing lessons because tomorrow you're going to observe lessons for two days. So if you don't have an effective framework for observing lessons, you can get things because we're all very smart people, but it might enhance your ability to get things for yourself and for your students. Uh, we're going to do a very quick basic sitting position because of course if you don't sit properly we all know nothing much will happen well after that. Um, some things in the last six months that I've noticed 
people not always understanding negotiating the different registers. So I want to go through that. Um, how we align the finger, hand, and arm. Some strategies for helping people discover that alignment. Turning in one piece, obviously. Issues related to rotating properly. There's turning in one piece, and then there's maintaining turning in one piece when you interact with the instrument. So when you interact with the instrument, then we have a host of other things which are really directly related to being able to continue to turn in one piece. Does that make sense? So keep that in mind. There's turning in one piece, but there's turning in one piece in relationship to making contact with the instrument. Okay. Theoretical work to help students practice rotation. I find it fairly common, and I see it even in the people that I work with, that um, you can't just go from teaching a single and double rotation in five fingers in the scale into music without a pretty structured framework for the student. It usually breaks down. People will usually say something like, well, you know, they were doing the scale fine, but then they, they started a piece and it, it all went away, all the rotation went away. So we're going to talk about certain ways to do that. If there's one word that I can give you that helps that not happen, the word is engagement. The more the student has engagement in the process, the more likely that situation will not happen, where it goes back and forth between no rotation and then big rotations because they have no rotation, and that gets into a kind of merry-go-round. Okay. Application of uh, rotation and in and out to a score. So there has to be a particular strategy, a particular structure for how you're going to go into a score. Um, and a few guidelines for starting to play intervals, octaves, and chords. We might get through all of this or, or not, but I want you to be satisfied with what, what you are getting. So please ask any questions. So let's move on. So there's something I call the five cornerstones of observing, which Stuart told me is not really a great thing because the building has four corners. But then I said, it, I could be referring to the Pentagon. So the, my five cornerstones of observing refers to the Pentagon. Okay. So this is a possible framework to get the most out of observing lessons. So if you feel satisfied in, in, in what you get from observing lessons, I'm not saying you must listen this way. I'm just offering it as a possibility. Um, sometimes corrections got, go by so quickly, we're not sure where or how to file them for the future. You know, sometimes watching somebody work and they're doing, they're saying this and they're saying this and they're saying this and they're saying this and they're, it's going by so quickly, there might be some result that happens, but the juice, the real value is in all the things that were said. Now, if there, we don't have a way to file those things, then it's kind of like an overwhelming experience and then you just think, well, I guess it's better, so good, that's nice. <laughs> so it's like you're happy for the person that it got better, but you're not taking away any value for yourself. Okay, so these are suggested categories to actively consider thinking while you are observing. The predominant internal question is, what is being worked on right now? And how would I store and use that while I am practicing or teaching? Does that make sense to you? So are we, we, we track, tracking any questions about that so far? Okay, so keep asking. Right now, what category or correction am I present to? Being instructed in one aspect does not mean many other things are not working. However, for clarity, it is helpful to focus on certain specifics to master them and work them into the body. So very often, if somebody's working with a, a student and you're observing it, they might be saying something like, well, do you have the rotation here? Always keep in mind that they're singling out something for clarity, but the real thing is that that person might do it better, but they're also doing it with a host of other things that are happening. So 
it's always important to realize that aspect, which is going to get clarified in a moment. Um, to say something about um, the list, the list is not a linear to-do list. So when I talk about this list, it's not like if you were sitting and practicing, you would do step one, you would do this two or step three, nor would you do that way when you're listening. So this is just, for lack of a better, it's, it's kind of, think of it, all these components in a circle with no one place being more important in a way than another. Okay. So these are various aspects that together make up the Talman work. So if you look at certain aspects, we're always looking from the perspective of alignment in all its forms. So sitting is an alignment because it's an alignment of the body to the instrument. The torso is an alignment. It has different things. We're going to talk about the registers. It has different places it needs to be. The fulcrums, the forearm, all of these things have certain alignments. We know very often that you can do a lot of things correctly, but the forearm is not in the right position and the passage doesn't work. So forearm position, alignment is important. We know that the alignment of the whole mechanism is important because without that, nothing works. You can't have good movement if the alignment of the, of the playing apparatus is not in a particular way. It's very important when you're watching somebody teach to be able to have clarity as to what component is being addressed in a given moment. So singling out the components is not a particularly bad thing because then you can store, if you can single out the component, you can store the corrections in the, comp in the category of that component. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Very often I think what people, what's happening is that they're latching on to the corrections. Okay? So that you get more and more in terms of what's good to do, what's bad to do, but what is the correction really in relationship to? So when you see what the correction is in relationship to, then your teaching will increase exponentially because it's like a skill. It's something that you see in relationship to something, so no matter who's in front of you, when that thing comes through your head, you're going to bring up that file. So is that clear? So it, it starts with trying to zero in, even if the person doesn't say it too clearly, they might, you might have to dig a little bit and think, what are they working on now? Are they working on a rotational aspect? Are they working on something with the in and out? What are, what are they working on? So we, what do we have? We have rotation, right? <clears throat> we have in and out. We have walking hand and arm and forearm, and we have shaping, right? So it might be that in a particular moment, somebody is, will be working on a component. More than likely, they're working on the process of combining. So there may be single out a component, but then it might go to another component. If you don't think of it in terms of combining, it might just seem like the scenery changed and you have no context for it. So all of a sudden the person's working on this and then they're working on that. They're working on that because in the background, what's being uh, done is trying to combine what they just worked on with something else to make it even better. So in explain the delicate nature of combination and how the technique works best when you include all the elements. This includes, as an extension of the basic technique, concepts of fingering, grouping, interdependence, and enslavement to notation. So all of these things, do you see how it, the, these are concepts that are in the background that might not be always presented in the foreground for you? But if you can extract it from the background, then you can use that as a file to store the kinds of corrections that are relevant to that issue. Make sense? Okay. So one of the very common pitfalls in, in the technique, either working or also in the teaching, is to stop one set of motion in order to practice another. So people can get very stuck in the technique after initial, initially the technique is put together by doing that kind of thing, focusing on one element to the exclusion of other elements. So the next area that you can be looking at if you're watching and observing somebody being taught is the area of proportion and all its complexities. Why is, important, why is 
Why is proportion important? Say that times, 10 times fast. <laughs> um, it's important because the size of the motions in relationship to each other will make or break a technique. Okay? So proportion exists in every component rela related to every other component. Okay? So if we took even one example of the basic technique, there's a fundamental relationship of the proportion of the fingers to the forearm. Right? Don't we start with larger forearm motions sometimes to, to, to show it? We hope that they're not huge. We start where the person can feel the rotation. But we know that you can't just go from that to playing, that we have many other issues. One of those issues is discovering the relationship, the proportion of how much finger is used in relationship to the forearm. What are the pitfalls there? You can use too much finger, it becomes isolated. If you have no finger and too much forearm, the person can't move fast. So you have proportion, so you might be moving properly. So do you see what I'm trying to open up for you is that you could be down a certain bunny hole thinking the rotation isn't right or this isn't right, but it might be that the problem is not there, that they really are in one piece, but the proportion of the items to each other are not uh, subtly felt or, or shown how to feel, and we're, we're going to talk about that. I find that that issue of proportion is at the heart of the whole issue with double rotation. So I, there are many, many proportion issues, but if you ask me where proportion is crucial, it's in mastering a double rotation. And there's the DVD on, is on the website now where we deal, where we, I talked about it and then Ed worked with somebody on the double rotation. So proportion is a huge thing. All of that could be going very well and a passage may still fail. Another area that gets worked on, but might go by you that that's an area that's being worked on, is key placements. So the essential application to the keyboard that strategically places the finger, hand, and forearm in the proper place for the best results possible. So you can have all the right motions positioned on the improper places on the keyboard and the passage won't work well. So it's very, can you see how that dovetails with proportion? Because say you start too far out, it's true maybe the fingers go into the thumb, but starting from too far out might make it unsuccessful. That's a proportion issue in a sense too. But it's also a key placement issue. See, so it's important to know what's more effective. So you start to see, oh, that person handled that from the key placement point of view. They didn't handle it from the proportion point of view. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you repeat yeah. that one more time? So yeah. they may have been aware of the key placement, but not applied the proper proportion to the situation. Is that what you mean? I would, I would put it a little bit the other way around. I would say that the motions, the physicality of what somebody's doing is correct. Let's say it's correct. So in terms of the finger, hand, and arm proportion, also correct. But the person is placing themselves on the improper places of the keyboard. You see what I'm saying? So they could be moving perfectly, but they won't feel very good in the passage because of that. But in a sense, that also dovetails with proportion because the distances are too great, say, or the distance isn't enough. The person hasn't come out enough. So, but they need, a key, they need to have some trigger from the key placement point of view. Just saying come out more might not make any difference to them. Because we get very fixated. Remember, our eyes are very fixated for many years here. So we, we, we don't always relate here because it's such a fixed thing. You know, it kind of uh, cancels out sometimes what we're able to feel. So sometimes people need to know, go exactly here, here, and here. Does that make sense? So you're saying yeah. those two bullet points, like you get to the same end result, uh, maybe by one or the other. Like, I think that they're very closely related, but I would say that it's crucial to identify which one it is that you need to go from. In other words, if you're going from the key placement point of view, but the person ha doesn't have good proportion in their playing, it probably won't make much difference. I would say that the, if they have good proportions in their playing, parts to the whole, 
the key placement issue would be very good, but just the proportion might not solve it. You need, it's like an extension in a way. It's, it's, it's a, a further refinement. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions coming up for you? Any, uh, any, um, uh, anything you'd like to say about it? Is it helpful at all? Yeah. Okay, helpful. Okay, good. All right, great. Um, so, you can see, in a way, that at any moment, wherever you're located, it's like one of those things, like when you see those maps and it says, you are here, you know, but it shows all the surrounding areas, so you have access to all the surrounding areas, but you are here, okay? It doesn't mean that, you know, Nordstrom's doesn't exist. It exists. You're just not there now, <laughs> okay? It's very important to remember that because as we talk about this, I want you to, to start to think a little bit about, okay, we're talking about this, but touch base and think to yourself, well, how would that affect so-and-so? How would it affect the component? How would it affect the ability to combine that with something else? Of course, if that right there, I don't think proportion is even possible. So, so there's that piece of it too. So, okay, so let's, let's talk about the basic sitting positions and alignments of the finger, hand, and forearm. So there's so much that we've done about um, sitting at the, at the instrument, so I don't want to do that sort of very detailed lecture on sitting. Basically, we know the sitting is for the purpose of getting the forearm level or slightly, slightly higher than the white keys. So that's where it is. So you understand sitting too low is not so good, sitting high, and you, know, you, you should understand all those compensatory things. That's really all located in the first video the 10 DVDs of the Talman. So if you have any questions about that, go to that, okay? But the end game is to have the finger, hand, and arm, which is your basic playing unit, be level or slightly above the surface of the white keys. So that's how you have to position yourself. There's the distance from the instrument. Of course, you don't want to be shoved up and you don't want to be so far back you're reaching. You want to sit on the front maybe two-thirds or half of the bench. So sitting in the back of the bench throws the weight backwards. We don't want that. So we want something that keeps us forward over the instrument. So do you, are there any questions about that? I'm happy to talk about it if you have a specific question. Yes? Um, I, this is just something that I see a lot with my students. They seem to be very reluctant to sit on the front half of the bench. And a lot of them want to lean backwards, and they tell me that that's comfortable. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice. I mean, this is mostly with the younger, well, I guess the non-teenage students. <laughs> Maybe, but... You mean with a younger student? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily really young, though. I see it with, with students who are old enough to not argue. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get it. You know, it's coming from various... Sometimes a kid just doesn't want... Yeah, yeah I, got, I got all of that. But maybe what could be a little bit helpful is to do a little bit of exaggeration. So they don't want to sit on the front half, so make them sit all the way in the back. Do an extreme, you know? And tell them, you know, and, and make them, you know, feel that there's no weight at the piano. So, that, so you have to make it obvious that it's an unworkable situation, okay? And then, you know, you keep telling them that you're not, tell them you're, we're not going to go as far forward as I think you should be. We're only going to go as far forward as you want to go. And just keep moving them up till they're where they are and they'll be happy. <laughs> so you have to do a little bit of, you know, kind of getting them there. Yeah, Beth. With younger students that um, you know don't reach the floor and they're yeah. using a stool, yeah. I have them sit a little further back. Is that not you know? What's it because of the knees? The because the knees are too high? Um. Why am I doing that? I don't know. I mean, I, I, when they have the stool, I have them sit a little further back on the bench. Here's here's what I would recommend looking for. Okay, you you really have to 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 sense when they're at the piano. Is the torso helping the forearm be forward, or is the torso having the forearm feel backward? Mm -hmm. That's really what has to happen there. So it might not be that they're terribly bad. I doubt you would put somebody so far back it's like wrong, but you might want to experiment where is that place where the weight is forward over the fingers? Because if the, finger do, if the forearm can't get to the finger, 
then it doesn't matter how, ma how the mo well the motions are, they don't have the support at key play when you depress the key to get it down easily. So there'll always be a sense of the finger working harder because it's a counterweight. If anything is falling backward, we can't just fall off the instrument. We have to keep playing. So in order to do that, some compensatory issue has to come into the, into the um, scene here. Usually what it is is the finger grips. And it could be very invisible. Yeah? I remember John having a lecture when you walk around the room, you kind of you don't walk backwards like this. But I always have to lean forward. And I always tell the kids to make sure they have their L. And I always say, you know, when you're watching something, you're always engaged. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the piano, you just, you're ready. Yeah. And don't forget that. There is a readiness. The torso is, you know, in the direction. I, I, I want to put it this way. It's in the direction of the instrument. It's not a fixed place, but it's in the direction of the instrument. It can't be straight up or behind. So it's in the direction of the instrument. Yeah, Darren. Uh, I have a student who has scoliosis. Mm -hmm. And when we were uh, in our first, first lessons, we were really uh, working on the sitting. And uh, we were trying the be uh, to find the best position for the torso as well. So I explained it as you did, and uh, we experienced this. But he said, because maybe because of his back, uh, if he is not sitting backwards. But when I uh, uh, when I make Move him sit a little bit forward, yes, he says, just like ten minutes later, it starts to. Uh, ache. Okay. So he we found found a place that he is neither back nor forward, mm -hmm. but c kind of forward but not forward, a bit straight, let's say. Uh -huh. And I asked, like, do you feel that your forearm is supporting? Up? Do you feel that you the weight of your body is towards your arm form? And he said yes. But when I look, he he's kind of yeah. straighter than. I have one suggestion. Okay, one suggestion. It, very often, when people think about getting closer to the instrument, okay, they don't necessarily move as a unit. It's like the finger, hand, and arm moving as a unit, mm -hmm. you know? So when they do it, it feels very uncomfortable because what they're actually doing is kind of, they're bending at what's called the seventh cervical. So there's a kind of this to get forward, which, but, do, which uh, doesn't we feel did, good. We did it from the so, it, it, so I would say there, you're sitting on your sit bones and it has to feel like the whole, entire torso is one piece. Yeah. Really yeah. Did, but, but also you have to realize that if there's a systemic situation there, if there's scoliosis or something, it's not going to be exactly like somebody who's not in that condition. So you have so to find it. he's comfortable, it. like he's comfortable and the, he's supporting the forearm, everything looks fine then. Yes, what, what I would keep my eye out for is down the road, you know, is do you, have, do you have a sense of something not working and can you, you know, rule out that it isn't because weight is falling backwards. It's, that usually will come up when people start to move out. Because if they're really not over the instrument, the out will, if there's a little bit of this, so I'm, do you see how I'm like a little, then the out plays, plays out very often. If the weight isn't originally over the keyboard, then you can't really move out and play down because you have to recover from something. You know, you can't really play down. So it might come up clear. It could be clearer there. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the upper arm. So the, the, the variables, why the upper arm is crucial is because you cannot turn in one piece unless the upper arm is behaving well. Okay, so what are the parameters of the upper arm? The upper arm is very, very difficult to, to work with because um, most people have something going on there, but then when you go to correct it, most people will overcorrect. Okay, so the two situations with the upper arm is if the upper arm is held up out a little bit. So when the upper arm is held out even a little bit, the motion of falling down, the finger, hand, and arm, is impeded. So we can't get that freedom if the upper arm is held out a little bit. But the antidote is not to pull the upper arm in toward the torso. See, so this is what you have to kind of help somebody 
uh, find, okay? What I, what I like to do is a series of things. I like to give an image, which is that the upper arm should feel hollow, because if it feels hollow, then it isn't flexed up and it isn't pulled in. If it's pulled in or it's held up, it can't feel hollow. The person will feel that there's activity there, okay? The other thing that's helpful is to, uh, maybe, Hector, can you sit here and I want to show something? Um, the other thing that I find very helpful is if the person begins to identify and locate their elbow. See, that the, that the finger, hand, and arm moves up and down in the elbow, okay? Now, that this, this is where the fulcrum is. When it's held up a little bit, they can't find it. Can you find it as well? Mm -hmm. No. So that, so see, the, in, the impeding of the freedom of the finger, hand, and arm is not because the finger, hand, and arm isn't free. It's because the upper arm is free, isn't free. See, well, I'm trying to also help save time because you can very much, probably a lot of people will identify that the finger, hand, and arm just doesn't look free enough. And you keep saying it's not free enough, but if you find the person is, you know, somebody willing to work, and you know, it's a good con situation, and it's not happening, I usually try to find the secondary causes for that. Upper arm is a secondary cause for the reason of the finger, hand, and arm not being able to go up and down freely. So if you, if you tell somebody not to hold up, most likely they'll try to pull it in. Mm -hmm. So now, now try to go up and down and pull it in. It doesn't, you can't do it. So it's delicate, right? Because it's a state of doing nothing. It's a state of not holding up and not collapsing in. That's not so easy to teach. Yeah, it's like, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, but you can see how that relates to turning in one piece. If that's not correct, turning in piece, one piece will be very difficult. Okay. Uh, obviously the wrist. In a way, we're going forwards and backwards in time here. I'm discussing this forwards and backwards, meaning they're very often when people turn, there's some sort of wrist adjustment that's not right. Either it goes up in the turn or people turn and it goes down. Okay? So we have to realize that, that that has to be very clearly understood in the body, that the wrist, although it moves with everything, it is a connector of the finger and the hand to the forearm. So it has to be in a position where you can turn easily. The wrist position in the turning doesn't change. So that I would be looking very much to see if as the person's turning, if I see this, then I know we're not going to be very successful in the rotation. If I see this when the person turns, I know we're not going to be very successful. So wrist, getting more subtle. There are certain things people do that are almost invisible. You all, and that's why it's very important to watch a person play before you ever teach them. Even if they're not, not completely healthy, if they can play just a little bit, it's very important because what you want to see is what is the basic alignment in that person. Because very often people are taught this to have this be strong. This is the bridge, it should be strong. And they have it up like this, okay? So we talk about that. Um, we talk that the bridge cannot be held up and the bridge cannot be collapsed. That's all in the alignment lecture, okay? So we recommend that the person feel that this is flat underneath, okay? That's one way to have them feel it. Also, I talk about if you turn your hand over, you should have the feeling that if a ball were placed here, you have no traction to hold it. In other words, if I pull these up, I feel like I can kind of hold a ball a little bit. If this is in the right position, I feel like there's no way a ball would stay here, okay? And then obviously if it goes too low, can't go anywhere with that, okay? However, you can solve that issue and you could even get a person to get to the piano with this solved. You can, you can do that. When they begin to turn, that motion will come back in. So watch in the basic turning, what is the relationship of that main knuckle to the hole? How is it, is it remaining neutral? 
Or is it going up a little bit? Or as they turn, does it go down a little bit? The middle knuckles. Oh yeah, I, I, the, the middle knuckle thing is really the main knuckles. Uh, if it's too high or too low, the strategies for helping students practice the correct position. No tenting, no pulling up, no collapsing. Moving the fingers to find the correct position. So there will be people that you'll encounter that can understand that it should not be up. Okay? They'll understand it shouldn't be like this. But as, you, as they do it, you still see that it's up. Okay? You have to teach them to move the fingers. You have to teach them to, to feel that set of knuckle because they can't move their fingers well if it's a little bit up. They might get the position of this through the movement of the fingers. See, when I move my fingers, this has to be in a certain place. Otherwise, I can't move my fingers. So do you understand I'm trying to save time? So Because you can keep saying this is too high to somebody, but it might not change for them because they don't have that other aspect, which is why does it have to change? <laughs> so sometimes it's very powerful if you can give them a reason why it has to change because something else has to happen. And if you have it like this, this cannot happen easily. If you have it like this, this cannot happen easily. So do it in relationship to moving the fingers. And suddenly, if they can move the fingers freely, you might actually say, well, that looks pretty normal now. Do you see? Just giving you different ways to come in at it. Sometimes we can see a very clear problem, like it's too high, but that doesn't necessarily mean if we keep working on that, that it might get solved. We might have to come in from another direction. So this is one connection that I've made over the years is that when I can't get the person to feel what's correct here, I start to move the fingers. And then suddenly, oh, this learns where it needs to be. Another thing about that situation is it's something very important in your teaching to store because the most common thing that happens in a student is every time they try to do another component and combine it, it goes into the high knuckles more than the low. So what does that mean? Obviously when they start to rotate, they turn and it goes a little bit high. It go, now, places it can go high. It can stay normal and that's fine. And it can go high when they play. So it can be in the playing, it can be in the moving. Does it make sense? So consider that. The moment you go into in and out, most likely, right up into the knuckle. That's what the in and out wrote you. That's how they do the in and out, okay? It's shaping the same way. It goes right into it. So in other words, it's something to track as you move through the different units, uh, components and are combining the components. Does that make sense to you? So sometimes we can solve something in one particular framework, but that doesn't mean it automatically will hold as we move to the other things. So it's something you store. The finger position, I think, I just put it here because it is relevant to turning in one piece. I think most people would, I, you know, you would identify this very clearly. You know, as you turn, the fingers shouldn't curl. As you turn, the fingers shouldn't straighten. Both of those things. So what you're looking for is that the fingers move in the natural position, which is the position that somebody attains when they're rested here. That's the natural position of the fingers. So the fingers are neither straight nor curled. And neither of those situations will work in being able to turn as a unit. If the fingers are a little bit curled, or a little bit gripped, this will not be free. That's how essential it is. If the fingers are a little bit straight, this will not be free. So I'm not a big fan of showing the rotation to somebody, which is going to be kind of the next thing. I'll do it now and I'll do it again. In front of the body with straight fingers. I've seen this a lot, like people showing the rotation, it's like this. I'm not a big fan of it because it's not actually how it functions and it, isn't, it can never be as free as if the fingers are in the natural position and you turn like this. Does that make sense? Feels great when it's all together. 
but to show someone that right away often just oh dies, absolutely yeah right so you would show, if you were to show that in front of your body you would just I would say, yeah, I would say here's, here's what I would be looking at. First of all, you, you don't always have to hit on the right thing at the, at the beginning. So, you know, I would show it in a moderate speed and see how the person adapts to it. And then go from there. If the person is extremely laborious, you might, you know, you might want to go faster a little bit to get it freer. If the person is just absolutely scattered, like this, they're not paying attention to anything, you can't go that fast. So there are t situations where sometimes you go very slowly and you say, your wrist went up. They go, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and they do it the same way. So, so it's only through, here's my firm belief. Anyone can make a correction. I, I firmly believe that anybody can make a correction. What I don't always believe is there is the environment inside of which serves the correction, okay? So the environment that you create has to be a specific way so that the person can actually make the correction, okay? So one, of, one factor is presence. So if the person isn't present, they can do something by luck, but yeah. most of our job, let's face it, is to bring an activity that has been done on automatic pilot for most people, sometimes for, for years and years, to a conscious level. That takes presence, and we are not trained to relate that way. And it's very difficult to take an activity that's in motion and bring presence and specificity to something, because in the brain it's like, I already know how to do this. Like, I can already play. Why do I have to do this? So there, it's not conscious, but all the time, and people, people are extremely willing. It's, it's not a cut on people. It's just the way human being kind of processes information. It, it, it first takes it in and attaches it to what they already know. And what we have to do very often is we're successful when we can separate what the person had been doing so that we have a clear space that they can then do something new and better, right? But that clear space has a certain presence of mind. You, without the presence of mind, it's just this way and that way, and there's no connection, right? So there is that kind of sl slowing somebody down slightly, you know, is, is one of my objectives. It's sometimes extremely challenging. It's sometimes the person can get even angry that you're slowing them down. But I think you have to find a way to bring them into awareness. Without awareness, I don't think this is the work for somebody. Because <laughs> it takes a lot of awareness. It takes a lot of presence, a lot of awareness, and a lot of self-monitoring. And we're going to talk about self-monitoring because I think it's also something that can really help you see better and better results if, if you can have people self-monitor and have strategies for having them self-monitor. Not just telling them, make sure you do this. Mm -hmm. That's good and works with some people and great. But there are an awful lot of people that's not enough structure for. Okay, let's go on. Um, so at that point where, where you get somebody on the instrument, you know, in one piece. So we're talking about being in one piece, not even turning, but just being kind of in one piece. Um, I would say that's the chance to start to teach them about registers, teach them how the torso is supposed to move. One of the things that I see very, very often is that people will move to the upper part of the register by just moving to the right. And then they talk about it doesn't feel very comfortable. The real adjustment to moving up to the treble is that combination movement. It's a combination of moving slightly forward and to the right. When you have the combination of moving slightly forward and to the right, you don't move very much. In other words, if I have to move only to the right without any moving toward the piano. Okay? And I really feel like the teapot that's ready to tip over. But if I combine that, you might not even see me move. Like, it's clear that Rubenstein moved, but when you look at him objectively, just like, 
let me look at him. He's, he's still. He's still, you know. But he's not really still. He's, if you tuned in, you can see a world of movement happening. Isn't that a lot less? But I'm here. You know, I'm here. You don't want that separation of the finger, hand, and arm, even if it's working properly. So obviously you have the mirror image working in the left hand. You have that going down and a little bit forward. The two other basic alignments that I would uh, say to tune in somebody into is moving slightly back to play in front, which might be, my reminds me, Beth, might be why you feel, because so much of the writing is in front, you might intuitively know that they can't be so crowded, so you might, might be a reason. I guess because they are shorter, this is shorter also, so, you know, I don't want them to be like this. So I yeah. guess the bench is a little closer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, at that, I would say absolutely. That's, that's an adjustment to be made. Be, yes, because actually, you know, for, for 25 years, I didn't teach children, okay? And then in the last two or two and a half, or three years, I have two. And it was, it was like an adjustment for me. It's like, they're like hugging the piano, but they weren't really, because this was really in the right place, but the body is physically closer. It was really weird to me. It's, it's like, this is, this is like stuffed into the piano or something for me. It was very odd because if for 25 years you've seen an adult who has a certain relationship to the instrument because of their physicality, it's very strange to see children. So I don't, it might, not, it might be perfectly fine, yeah. Okay, so do we have the register thing? And the only other register adjustment that comes up is when hands play at the extreme ranges. So when hands play at the extreme ranges, the torso has to give and move forward because you don't want to be stretched out like this and the weight is completely behind you. So it just adjusts, it takes very little. Can you see, I, I go like this and my hands already shoot out to here and I'm fine. So those are the four basic adjustments. Now, that sounds very simple, right? But when you get in the heat of the moment of correcting passages with people, it's not the first thing we think about. You know, we're thinking, what's the in and out? Did they do it? And sometimes the torso is like, everybody's like working over here, and the person is over here, and everybody's working over here. It's really kind of funny, you'll notice it. So realize that you can't, um, you know, get so focused that, that once again, we're in this circle, right? So that's as important as whatever you're addressing. Everything is kind of holding everything up. So it, it, to me, teaching is very much like, I used to use this example a lot, but then my students started to get a little younger and they looked at me like I had three heads. But when I was a kid, they used to be on TV, they would have these like straws from the, from the floor. There would be like 12 of them. And they would spin plates on the straws, okay. And so, and the object was don't let the plates fall. So you're tending to this, but this, you have to make sure this is going and this is going and you make sure, but you're kind of, your eyes are in 12 places and in one place at the same time. And for me, teaching this work is very much like that. You're tending to this, but you're, you're making sure that this is kind of still happening and that's still happening and that's still combining. Because if this one falls, then it has a, uh, an effect on other things. So does that make sense? To, does that make sense? Okay, great. Okay, let's talk now about actually turning in one piece. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's a lot of information that you can use to see if some problem with turning in one piece comes up. You, you have, a, I hope, a little bit broader base here to go from. All right. How to identify the finger, hand, and arm as a unit? The most uh, effective way that I've ever found is that the person is crystal clear what their objective is. Sometimes people say, well, here's the rotation, and just like and it's not clear what is actually moving in the body, okay? I think it helps very much to identify that what's moving is a unit of the finger, hand, and arm from the tip of the third finger to the elbow. I think people have to understand that. Talbin used to call it one bone, to think, think of it as one bone all the way back turning. She used to use the image to put the arm in front like this because that helps also the role of the upper arm. When people just rotate in the air, the upper arm learns to do all kinds of things incorrectly. So having the upper arm be neutral, you'll get it neutral more likely like this than like this. It's not 
an absolute rule, but I would say try it here. If this is absolutely impossible for somebody, try it here. You can try it, but here I find that the upper arm behaves quite nicely. And it's important because at the beginning of teaching the rotation, what you want to make sure is that they fully understand that it's a movement of the finger, hand, and arm. You see, if something else gets into that mixture, it takes a long time to sort that puzzle out. Meaning, if you turn like this, and something's turning like this, and you don't quite catch it, you know, this is kind of like this, it will come up eventually. Do you see, see what I'm saying? So having the upper arm there really gives the person the experience that this is the tool they're using. So there is a kind of like, um, I don't want to call it, the word is not isolation, but there's a specificity to the movement. The finger, hand, and arm are turning, okay? Everything else is there to support that movement. She used to talk about having the, the, the palm to the heart and then the floor, the heart and the floor. Now, one thing I think I want to add to that is I'm not a big advocate for having people turn as far as humanly possible. I don't think it's a very healthy thing. I think it, it first of all, gives the wrong uh, kinesthetic experience, and it's not that useful. What I would say to somebody is turn only as far as you can feel it, you know? So it doesn't make it better if they do it like this. You know, it doesn't make it better. Just turn as far. So turn it in a smaller field, so to speak. Because I think the first thing somebody would do is to go to what is called the extreme range of motion. You see, if you go and you feel it stop, that's way too far. Does that make sense? So from the very beginning, sometimes I use the image that it's a tube turning inside of a tube. Can you get that image? Like if you just think of your arm as a tube turning inside of a tube. And if it makes no sense to you, don't pay attention to it. Okay. <laughs> so we actually did some of this. The role, we did the role of the upper arm. We did the role of the elbow. The fact the elbow can't be up, it can't be down. The role of the wrist, the main knuckles. The role of the fingers, we did that. So, let's take like five minutes. We've been at this an hour. Let's stretch or, you know, move around. And um, we'll take five minutes, then we'll come right back. Okay. So let's say at this point, you feel you've um, had the person experience being in one piece. You've addressed everything we've talked about. Now it's time to get to the piano. So we have to have... There are certain things that come up in getting to the piano, some things that are very difficult to see sometimes. So let's, let's talk about a few of them. Um, one common error is to try to, to play a key from too high. You know, try, it, it, that doesn't really help very much. So it, it's just far enough to be able to fall. So I would say that varies person to person, but it's not, it's within a range. So that's the first thing. It's sometimes very difficult to pe for people to understand the quality of the motion you're talking about. We use the term controlled free drop because sometimes people drop like a free-for-all. Mostly people are tight. So they go sometimes from tight to like this enormous drop of bricks into the <laughs> instrument. So. There's a, there, there, there are certain things we can do to help the contr controlled free drop. If you put somebody on their lap, you can give them an image. You can say that when your arm drops, you should feel that this came down with you. You should have an inner sense that even though you go up, your forearm still stays down. So what does that mean? As a feeling, we can go up and down and still maintain that the forearm is down. Yeah. It's an inner sense. So what I'm saying is, sometimes what people do is they go up, and there's a real definitive up, and then a down. And that takes away that the, the gesture is done in one gesture, meaning the up and down have to merge. I like the image of a trampoline. When you, go on, when you jump on a trampoline, you don't go up to a specific place. You go up to wherever gravity begins to bring you down. 
Okay? So there isn't like a specific place in, that you're aware of that you go up to. You're just going up and the experience is that you go up to a place where you come down. The same thing on the lap. They shouldn't have an experience like they're bringing it up to a specific place and then bringing it down. That helps merge that moment, which is the reason why it, sometimes it's not very free. Because that moment is too distinct to them. There's a, there's, there's, there's a moment that just changes and brings it down. Wait, you're saying that they shouldn't think of going up to a certain point. They should not think of going up to a certain point and then bringing it down. Okay. The up and down have to become merged into one experience. That helps very much because that gives you the ability to fall up. That sounds like a crazy term. But the, in, the, the thing that we're looking for is the ability to fall up onto the instrument. To maintain the sense of falling down, but you're putting your hand up on the instrument. So we're falling up to the instrument. So we talked about the common pitfalls to being free is stopping the motion. Going up and somewhere along the way stopping the motion. So one thing that I notice a lot is that sometimes it sounds... Um, Maybe like it wouldn't be the case, but it actually works very often. The reason somebody doesn't fall up is to the piano is because they go too slowly. There has to be enough momentum to fall on. So the, the gesture is rather quick. Look for a quicker gesture versus when they lumber along, then other things get in the mix, like mischief begins to happen. It's slow and the upper arm kind of just helps it, or it's slow and the wrist kind of gets in there. When they go a little bit faster, sometimes you can circumvent those problems. So it's a place where a little faster is actually a little bit more effective than slowly. When they get on the keyboard, I think one of the most important things to begin to deal with is that they don't position over each key. If you get to the piano and you're, you, you don't um, have an intervention around that, where by the time you've played the piano for two or three months and are taught little positions, that's there already. So, you know, it's not, it's the parameters would be that we don't force fingers closer than they are in nature. But if we go to the piano and I go on my second finger, I have a rather large hand, I don't cover one note per finger. So that's important. Why is that important? Even at that sort of microscopic level, that little bit of stretching makes doing the rotation ten times harder. It tightens everything behind it. So turning and not having any stretching, turning in one piece, also depends on no stretching. You see how many factors are involved here. Everything could be good, the fulcrums are great, everything. there's a little bit of stretching and this isn't free. Okay. Many people, I think, um, in the past, I've seen this much more than, than recently, I think th things are more understood in this area, but it comes up occasionally where still people come and the thumb is on the keyboard. So the minute you're, all on, you're on all white keys and the thumb positions itself, you have twisting. So twisting, not going to make the rotation free. Yes? I, I think uh, Petrina has uh, on the, had a really, really small hand at age nine, and I still did not put the thumb on the keyboard. So that, so I, for whatever reason, yeah, it just it's just a little bit turned. Um, let's talk about uh, the thumb. I might have it later, but let's talk about it right now. No, I do have it later. Let's talk about it now. Position of the thumb. Things can be not unified and not turn in one piece, very related to what the thumb is doing. So what the most common thing that the thumb wants to do is get to the instrument and relax down. So that relaxing down is not great, it's bad. Now, when you show somebody that, their most common thing is to pull it up and they try to hold it up. One effective thing to having them discover the thumb and how it's quote unquote neutral, is to turn the hand over like this. Turn the hand and let the thumb just be natural. And say, okay, now just turn your arm around. You're not holding your thumb, and you can see the thumb is not here. Say it's here. Why that's important is because what happens very often, say you're on three, 
and you're rotating to two. The rotation to two could be really corrupted if when you land on two, the thumb continues down. Usually the thumb continues down on the landing of whatever notes before it. So that landing stops here, but there's a continuation in the thumb. That's, that's relaxation. So anything that relaxes like this is not going to help the turning, not going to help you rotate better. Um, I let it fall in. Um, I, I, I don't think that it's out here, but it's not under. It's not really under. It's on the side of the two. But sometimes in this position, if it's just a, a close, I would say close by. It's not really under. To me, under is there. It's here. But it's not, you know, it's not doing that. Mm -hmm. But in the crossing, you know, sometimes it's in a crossing, you know, that the thumb is kind of behind the two. Oh, yes, that's a completely different scenario, yeah. Yes? Can you repeat, you said when you're going from three to two, and then you said something, a, a really good sentence, the thumb is... Yes, so, we're, so let's relate it back to turning in one piece and being unified at every moment. So one of the things that would disrupt that is say I was on three, okay, and I rotate to two, but when I play two, my thumb takes on a life of its own. I arrive on the bottom of the key of two, and my thumb continues down, so it relaxes after the fact. Right. Then I'm no longer I am no, I'm no longer connected. But you said something because when you play open three to two, the thumb should be with two, right? And then as you play two, it stops, so it doesn't continue down. Okay, so where does it stop? Where does it sit on the key? It's good. No, because I, I wouldn't even be showing the thumb. So what I'm saying is if we're doing, we're, the first way I show rotation, which will come by the second, is on four keys. Okay, so five, four, three, two. Thumb is it. But I would show the rotation three to two. What I'm trying to make sure is that there's no activity like this. Okay, so we're checking any stretching and the, key, the thumb off the keyboard to start. So I think it's just more problematic, but see, I understand why people put the thumb on the keyboard because they don't want this to happen. But see, I think we have you just be conscious that you have to have that step where they can feel that so that it doesn't have to be on the keyboard and it doesn't have to fall down. But also watch out because the next thing they want to do is attach it up. So they want to scotch tape it to the second finger and that's not going to work either. Okay? All right. So this gets subtle, checking for the invisibles. Sometimes the turning is not free in one piece because of invisible things. What are the invisible things? When a person turns, they're pushing on the bottom of the key. There's a grabbing or a pushing or any kind of relaxing. The tendency for people who have also been taught to relax is very, very great and it's, it's an awareness that they, they have to come to what relaxing really is. When they play, they play and instantly relax things. The moment you relax something, it's not a vital thing that can turn well. It's now something that will invite a lot of mischief. Okay? So the point here is, I check that aspect because you could be going down a lot of bunny holes seeing a lot of wrong things. You could see, oh, oh the wrist is all wrong. You could see a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's at the source of the problem. I always check forcing or relaxing to see if that's at the source of a problem. If somebody is not connected to their forearm, it could be because they force or because they relax. And that also has the, whenever there's relaxing, the weight is falling backward off the keyboard. There's no way to maintain that sense of being balanced over the instrument when, when you play and relax something. And people can, let's talk about relaxing. Relaxing doesn't always look like this. Doesn't always look like that. I'm going to show you, and you probably will see it, but you have to, you, you have to realize how subtle it can be. Okay, there was one I relaxed on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, I tried to do it as subtly as possible, but can't it, can't it kind of go by? 
Like it's not it's not so obvious, you know. It's the it's the kind of just that. Can you can you catch it? It just it goes in and then yeah, it's yeah, a little yeah. bit. This. People have been trained to make beautiful sound. It's the shock absorber. They they play and it's a little bit like this. People have been told to relax. They actually land and it's so integrated into their system to land and let go a little bit. So they're letting go of, of the key bottom really. There is a contacting, the fingertips contact. They take hold of the key, they don't grab, but they take hold of the key. And everything balances, like, like a ballerina balances on the point, you know, the whole thing is balanced on there. They have to have that feeling. That's where you begin to get the quality of easy solid. You know, we talk about easy solid. That's easy solid. When, when there isn't forcing, and there isn't relaxing. There are two main options that, that I've uh, seen. Some people prefer to start turning and use the B major or E major model, and some people prefer white keys. I'm a white key person. You know, you have dark meat and light meat people. I'm a, I'm a white key person. But I just want to sh tell you that, that there is that option if you feel that starting on, the, on a B major where, where the distribution of fingers is a little bit more how the hand is built is easier. You have to evaluate and we're going to talk about evaluating too. Okay, so if I start on white keys, uh, we talked about no thumb to start. Uh, we talked about the thumb should not fall nor hold up. Turn hand over and test the thumb's distance to give a sense of where it is naturally. That's what I was talking about when I did this. Okay. So now we're up to rotating and a checklist to keep in mind. Is the movement free? Is it felt as one piece from the tip of the third finger to the elbow? We've discussed that. Okay. I recommend, uh, you know, the, this is going beyond drops, clearly. So, so you've established drops, drops get the alignment and everything. You make sure the fingers aren't curled, you make sure the fives are not pushing out. You know all of that technology. So that has a lot to do with alignment. When the alignment is good, and each finger looks good to you, they look like they're good on five, they're good on four, good. it's time to take this experience of turning and start to apply it to the instrument. In the application to the instrument, let's talk about what begins to happen. So let's say I play five. I Start out with making a turn to, to the second finger. For me, that seems very logical. Sometimes the brain cannot get the purpose of rotation when all it has to do is go from here to here, a half step. It's so illogical in a way. So I find that it's clearer to a person that they have to rotate because it's moving that second finger by itself is very obvious, right? So turning over second finger to there. So, um, one of the main reasons people don't turn freely is they have a concept, and you'll, you have to dig it out, that the contact point on the fingertip should not change. So they're desperately trying to turn, and you'll see all kinds of bad habits. And you could start addressing all those bad habits, or you can check in a second and say, when you turn, are you allowing the finger to go to a different place on it? See, in the learning process, if you don't allow that finger to roll off its contact point, then you're going to have a lot of problems in trying to get somebody to rotate. So they're going to stay there and they're going to try to rotate, but the thought in the background is, I'm not allowed to move that finger anywhere. Do you see, do you see that? how that could create more steps? Find If they're doing this well and it doesn't look the same there, that might be a major factor. It comes up so often for me. People get the idea that the finger has to be straight in the key. So in the learning stages, you have to allow them to roll off the contact point, not lose contact. So are we clear? I'm not saying lose contact, but roll off the contact point. So we do that. So the first question I'm looking for, when I know the motion is there, I'm looking to see if everything stayed correctly. I'm looking to see that the wrist didn't fall when it turned, I'm looking to see the wrist didn't lift when it turned, I'm looking to see this didn't go up, I'm looking to see that the elbow did not fall. That's huge. The elbow falling when people start to rotate is very common. They do this and they don't realize it. And it doesn't look right, but you're not realizing why. 
it's the elbow. So the way I get into the elbow, let's go on to the next page. So I said wrist dropping, elbow dropping, holding out, fingers curling, straightening, main knuckles going high again or falling, shoulders holding up or down. It's a miracle any of us play, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just. But all those things are possibilities. Not everybody has all that. Okay. So the point is not to to pull everybody through the same method. Okay. The point is to just have some familiarity with those situations so that you can identify them. The faster you can identify what's holding it up, the faster you can get in and out of the surgery, so to speak. In other words, the less on the operating table that the patient has to be. And that's always good. The, le the less anesthesia, the better, right? If you have somebody in a process for months and months and months, they're more likely to not be motivated, to be discouraged and all of that. And we're going to go through some of that later. I have some stuff on that. But what I'm saying is, the more expertly you can identify the problem and have a strategy for fixing it, you can be the engineer in the sense of putting that mechanism together. You know, really getting the basic work in as quickly and as easily as possible. But it takes a lot of looking in particular ways and particular strategies to do the process quickly because you also can't skip steps. See, this is what's very difficult about this. You can't, it takes a lot of things, but it also, you have to keep in mind whom, whom you're teaching. You also have to keep in mind how you pace it. Some people cannot be overwhelmed by five million things at one time. Some people do not have the willingness, interest, motivation to do this kind of in-depth work. You have to kind of evaluate. All right, let's go on. Uh, wrist falling, check the way the student ima imagines the trajectory of the rotation. So here's another reason why the wrist would fall. They imagine the rotation this way, okay? And so in that image, that's what happens, okay? So the image that I like to suggest is more this way, an oblique angle like that. Now they're not doing that. I'm not saying to do that. It's just an image. Taking the image from this to that. Can you see the difference in the, in the functionality? So this functions this way or functions this way? Look, the first thing I would say is don't drop your wrist, obviously. But then they go, okay. <laughs> and they do it again. So you have to dig. Why did they do that? They are listening. So there must be some secondary reason. So I look also to that. What is their image of the rotation? Sometimes they're just not clear biomechanically what to focus on. And it helps to clarify it biomechanically. I find something very useful here is to explain that there are two bones in the forearm. The elbow is the stationary bone and the other bone revolves around the stationary bone. So they can feel the sense that the elbow doesn't lift and drop because they know, oh, there are two bones in there. Sometimes they just think of the forearm as the forearm, like this, right? So separating that in their mind gives them the freedom to, oh, I can turn around the stable fulcrum. We did the next one, main knuckles. Often people with a high bridge tend to do this in every skill. Check that the bridge remains in the correct alignment during the turn. So much of rotation goes, goes uh, badly because of that main knuckle bridge. Turning and just going up a little bit or landing and just going up a bit, it just it ruins the, the unity. You can't turn in one piece when that happens. When they turn, these are the invisibles. Are they grabbing the key to turn? Or are they neutral on the bottom of the key? Rest it down. Rest it down is a very, very difficult thing because it's words to describe an experience. Some of the things that are, you have to be conscious of is to help somebody find the proper resting, they can't go fast into the key because if they go fast into the key, they hit the bottom and this is not the right resting. So they can't go into the key and stop somewhere because then they're hovering up. So we say that resting down is not a heavy resting. It's just enough resting of the finger, hand, and arm to overcome that key. I have found a few cute little things to tell people that seem to help. Feel free not to use them. Um, one thing is to make a person aware that, wait a second, this is just a piano key. It's not a refrigerator. You're not moving a refrigerator. Just a piano key. 
because people have a kinesthetic experience of playing this instrument and struggling with this instrument for many years. It is not automatically because you show them how to move differently, their physical relationship to what they're doing changes. They can maintain the same level of work, internal work that they've had and, and muscle through with better movements. Their playing will be better, but it will never be optimal and it will never be a physical experience that grows inside of them. It will just be it's better. So the idea that um, it's, it's, you know, that. And the other thing that I found powerful is to appeal to, the, to logic. Now that you have YouTube, these things are so much easier. Go on YouTube, Google seven-year-old Chopin etudes, make sure you have a good drink with you, yeah. and watch, you know, hundreds of kids age seven play Chopin etudes, okay? <laughs> they have no years of muscular development, they have no inherent strength that's different than anyone else, but somehow because their finger, hand, and arm are aligned, they have no problem putting keys down. So certainly, if you're teaching an adult, who they tend more to force and to be very heavy. You can say, if a child of five, when aligned, can put the key down, certainly the finger, hand, and arm of a mature adult has all it needs to put the key down. You don't have to add any effort to that thing. You go up with the finger, hand, and arm, and it comes down, it has more than enough. Tell them the key doesn't have a chance. <laughs> it doesn't have a chance of staying up. That key is going down. Okay? Now, in terms of using words to instill a feeling, try, there, there's a wonderful thing, it's called balsa wood or something. It's a kind of wood, but it floats in water, you know? It has a kind of buoyancy to it. The finger, hand, and arm should have that kind of light buoyancy. That light buoyancy will be more than enough weight to put a key down and to hold it down. So that kinesthetic, in what we call the inside feeling, you know, you have those outside feelings of how the rotation works, how this, but the inside feeling is the quality of the motion. And if, you, if you're able to bring the quality of the motion up at the same time that you're bringing the motions into the body, it's always so much better. The technique ends up being so much better as a result of that. And people become more sensitized to what they need and sensitized to how things work. But it takes sometimes educating somebody's kinesthetic body. What should it feel like? It shouldn't feel like a ton of bricks. You shouldn't feel like your arms are balloons hanging in the air. You have, maybe have to find some images. You have to feel nicely neutral and rested. Everything has to feel down. When you're on the bottom of the key, you can't have any activity that feels in the opposite direction. Does that communicate? Okay, great. Uh, many, many times, the turn will not be in one piece and it will not be free. So, so what I wanted to say is interject here is that there's turning in one piece as a physical experience, okay? There's turning in one piece as an experience when it's in relationship to playing the keyboard. So once the body comes in contact with the outside agent, then there, that's another scenario because the person can do this very well but get to the keyboard and it's not good. So we need both. If they can't do this well, likelihood of doing it at the piano is very small. But they can do this maybe sometimes very well, but it changes radically when they go to, 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 in, in, um, to um, interface with the instrument. So one of the things that, that is very common is the thumb. Thumbs are very problematic, even in starting the rotation. So when the thumb is involved improperly, you'll see things like this. They'll turn, but the thumb goes a little bit like this. So the thumb is going to the right, and the arm is trying to get to the left. People, believe it or not, sometimes people feel very physically vulnerable in the act of rotating. They feel like it's, it would be like trying to, you know, stand sideways and, 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 and you know, balance something on the other hand. They feel off balance because in a sense, isn't that what we're asking them to do? We're asking them to be perfectly in balance and go to a state of being on the side, which is not the same state as being on both feet, right? So they try to stabilize that experience. They try to go to there, but in the background, they want their thumb to, to, to keep them stabilized. 
And it's that give them permission to go over there. Let your thumb go over there with you. Be unstabilized. In advanced pianists, I can tell you, anybody who plays and is very harmonically based, the thumb will hold somewhat. They, they just want to know that that's the chord they're playing and they're willing to turn as long as the thumb doesn't go anywhere. Okay? People with high knuckles, same thing. They'll turn, they'll lift the fingers, they'll turn the forearm, but that has to stay strong and in place. So it's a geographic thing for many people. They have a sense from their playing of being geographically in positions. And so the willingness to turn is very scary. It's very, very vulnerable. They don't, they don't like that, that experience because how are they going to play the right notes? How are they going to get to the right places? So you have to deal a little bit with what I call the pianistic psychology. You know, really getting into that, if that person is very harmonically based, you can say all the right things unless they're willing to not know where they are. It's really, sight readers, same thing. People very adept at sight reading and reading several uh, measures ahead sometimes even. Also, the hand wants to fix itself, it wants to be fixed. Once that's in place, you can't have the freedom of the rotation as much. I have on occasion with people, gone with them when I'm teaching them to apply it to music, and only given them one note. And then I go to the next one and I have to rotate to the next one. It kills them. They're just, it's just, you can see, it makes them extremely anxious. Mm -hmm. But that's an aspect of the presence I'm talking about. See, without that, no matter how much they want to concentrate note to note, they can't because the mind is trained another way. It's trained to look ahead. It's trained to feel what the next things are. So sometimes, look, a lot of what we do is an intervention. It is literally a physical intervention because you're taking a deep-seated habit and you're bringing it to a conscious place and you're really allowing the body to be neutral for a second and then implement something better. But the message to the brain actually has to be extremely strong and extremely clear for somebody to change a habit. Very, very difficult. That's why piano playing for centuries has not improved by people suggesting things. Have your arms feel like they're, they're swimming. Have the, 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 you know, those things. Because they don't work like that. What works here is a note-to-note -note phenomenon that has to work in a particular way. That takes a lot of awareness, it takes a lot of presence to get that note-to-note -note thing going on. That's why the thinking can be excruciating, it could be exhausting. It could be why a person can only be there for 10 minutes at a time at the beginning. Because the amount of concentration to be present to everything that you're asking them to do can be excruciating. Meanwhile, on the flip side of it, you can't get the person self-conscious where they lose all naturalness. It's a very difficult game we're all up to in the sense because there's a lot of balancing going on. All right, let's talk about, we did the, rotating in a checklist to keep in mind. Is the f movement free, felt as one piece, from the tip of the third finger to the elbow? We talked about playing five and make a turn to go to two. Did all the fulcrum stay in alignment? This is where old habits come back. So we did that. Oh, I was further ahead. Okay. Um, after the thumb not coming along, it's number six under some suggestions for various issues. Number six, was the turn pure? This is another detriment to getting the rotation in internalized. We're clear here that rotation is a means that gets internalized into a person's body to give them another experience, right? It's not about in a funny way, going on stage and showing everybody your perfect single and double rotations. That's not a successful implementation. The implementation has to come full circle. In other words, if we look at it, for, I suggest looking at it, from, at it from this point of view. A prodigy plays and doesn't know how they do it. Okay? Taubin came along, she decoded it, gave it to people in a learnable and teachable way so that they could actually have the same experience that the prodigy has. Okay? But 
as with the prodigy, a lot is happening correctly. So that's why we have to be able to teach the pieces so correctly that the watch, in a way, runs by itself. Okay? So and all of these things I'm talking about stop the watch from running by itself. That's why people will say, I went to the piece and I lost the rotation. It went away. It has to be so internalized in the system that it wouldn't go away. It becomes a new way of playing. So let's talk a little bit um, about was the turn pure? I'll give you some ways that the turn is not pure and the most predominant way that it is not pure is when it's a sagittal movement, when it's just a kind of sideways movement and people think they're rotating. It happens very often. Say you're on five and they go to rotate and it looks like this. They think they're rotating, you know, but it's not a rotation. That happens fairly often, you know, especially in this direction because of the elbow thing. So you've, that's why the purity, that's why all of these things have to be there because th what I would say to the person to, to make that better would be play five. In this instance, I would tell them to turn and stop on the left so that they can see that this actually turned halfway and turn back, halfway and back. Until they get at home with the fact that they can differentiate. What you're trying to get with them is abilities to differentiate. They have to, it can't be because you say it's sideways. It's because they experience the difference. So contrasting experiences can be very, very helpful. Having them contrast this experience with this experience, extremely helpful. Okay, that's one way. Another way is that as they turn, they let go of the bottom of the key slightly. So that's like losing your footing in the moment you want to jump. The moment you want to jump, you release the foot you're jumping from. You have no place to jump from. So it has to remain on the bottom. It's less common, I would say, than the gripping, but it happens quite a lot. So occasionally, if you, you know, it's a place to kind of look from. Come around this side if you're sitting over there. Come here and look at the key. Watch them turn. And you can see, if you're, if you're tuned in here, can you see? Just a little bit, I let go. And then I know this no longer can be free. Everything's holding. So that's where also mischief can come in. Because they go like this and then there's nothing to turn from, so they just move it over to here. So watch that. The difference between a pure turn and anything else. Is it releasing enough that the key is going to come up, or does it sometimes happen even if the key is not going to come up? I would say I would deal with it with the key, literally visually seeing the key as you're turning raise. Okay. If it doesn't do that, I wouldn't okay. suspect it. Okay. Um, w well, I mean, that is, a, that is an issue where it's the opposite of forcing. So they're playing, and somewhere they're releasing, they're relaxing or releasing something up. So you have to find out where it is. It could be in the upper arm, but mostly I think if they just know it's possible. The image I tell them, it's like, okay, if you're going to rotate, say you're in your living room, you're watching TV, you love what you watch, but you're really tired. And you know, the controls are over there and you do not want to get up and get them. So you just roll over, okay? You're never losing contact with the floor. You're just rolling, right? You don't get up. People love that. Don't get up, yeah, I like that, that's great. Okay, when you turn the rotation, don't get up. Just keep it down, just roll on the bike. You're also rolling on the floor and you're not pushing down on the floor. You're not rolling over to get to the thing and pushing down your body on each roll. You're just there, you're neutral. But there's a certain contact with the floor, right? That's a very familiar experience for most people. Does that help? It's hilarious too, isn't it? Yeah. That's good. All right. Um, check that it's not sideways or lateral movement. So, so the, the sideways lateral, I find that, that to be the most common thing. That it's not a pure turn. Um, say all of that's going correctly. You do want to focus in, is there any stretching? Does the finger get ahead of the hand and the forearm? 
Let's talk about that issue because Taubin had the most brilliant thing to say about correcting that. So what does it mean for the finger to get ahead of the arm? It's like everything looks kind of right, but it also looks kind of tight. So it's like this. So the finger reached over there and it brought the arm as a secondary thing, right? So it's really kind of crazy because it's such a split second timing. You know, it, the, the finger has a movement, but the finger doesn't have a movement that reaches itself. The finger has a lifting motion in the turn to the right, left, and a dropping motion in the turn to the right. Okay? So, what she used to say is turn to the left, keep all of your fingers there, and just let your arm fall back. Just let the arm fall back. And that helps people realize that they actually can get there without having to position the finger ahead. Very, very important. The other side is the releasing side. So people very often will play a key, they'll go to the next key, they'll release that key, and the finger stays exactly there. So that has a detrimental effect to the overall rotation because there's no releasing. It's a, it's a, it's a split-second timing. You know, that, that play and release issue, I try to clear up with people by doing this. If I can borrow you, Hector, for one second, just, you can stay right where you are. Uh, or maybe come up here so we can get this on camera. So what I try to explain to them is that playing and releasing is very much like this. If you don't release soon enough, you have this situation. Take the pencil. Take it. Okay. All right? Okay? If I release too soon, like I said, as you were turning, the key comes up, you have this situation. Take the pencil. <laughs> okay? So what really happens, it's kind of a handoff in football. You take it, and at the same time you take it, I let it go. Hmm. So that's the transfer, thank you. That's the transference of, of weight, first of all, but that's, it has to do with timing. So you can't have a transference of weight without having a particular timing. You know, we don't take a step and then decide to drag our back foot to where we're neutral so we can take another step. There's a kind of way we take a step and there's a release. There's some kind of coordination there. This is a particular coordination. And it's not always an easy coordination for people to get. But they have to have that sense. Otherwise, you can't really play and release. Then the release is something phony or, or it will always remain stretched. So you have to have the timing aspect. All right, let's, um, let's talk about the rotation in, in the ascending direction. So turning in one piece, but going, say, up in the um, right hand and down in the left hand. The rotation is possibly more difficult to learn and master at first. Most people will say that that direction is harder, okay? It's not physically harder, it's more complicated to get it correctly because more things have to line up correctly to, for it to be felt well. So let's talk about it. <coughs> the most important thing is that you allow for the elbow to give slightly, to allow the forearm to feel free in the turning. What does that mean? If I say to myself, the elbow can't move, you can't really turn in that direction. But here's why people don't want to do it, because they're terrified, because they know also that we speak very much about the chicken wing how you're not supposed to do the rotation from the upper arm. One of the things that I find very helpful is have the person stand up and to actually turn their own forearm and observe that as they turn their forearm, the elbow's coming along with them. And when the elbow comes along with them, there's certain sympathetic movement in the upper arm. I'm not actively moving my upper arm, but I'm not stopping it from moving. See, if I stop this, I can't turn. So you turn, and the elbow comes out like this. That helps them understand what happens here in this, in this sort of place. So as it turns, the elbow gives a little bit, but it gives a little bit as a response to the finger, hand, and arm. It doesn't have an active duty and it doesn't hold. So what we say is check the upper arm that it is free and responding. 
and teach them, learn to identify the correct, uh, identify and correct the chicken wing movement. So when you have them have that, that's a contrasting experience to me. This experience, just do it from the upper arm. Do it from the forearm and have the upper arm come up. They have to experience. They have to be able to, to di differentiate between those two physical experiences. Okay. Uh, rotating between five and two and five and three, then add so then what I would do is I would begin to, after you do some distances, you can do five to three, you can do five to four. Once you're able to do that and then go in a row, five, four, three, two. That's very good if you can do it in both directions. That would be my first objective, to get somebody to rotate down and up on four fingers. At that point, that's where I would say you can add the thumb. Um, try to achieve at least five fingers up and down in both hands before applying. It is highly recommended to get the whole scale learned with the in and out combined and the rotation minimized before applying it to music. So I'm not a very big fan of people applying very large motions to, to pieces of music. I don't, I don't think it's, it's very helpful. I think you have to have that minimizing process, which is explained in that DVD on the double rotation. There's a lot of stuff already on the website about minimizing the double rotation, all of that. Um, I do want to say something about beginning to combine it with the in and out. Here are some pitfalls that people have, and it can be in a very advanced pianist. The biggest one I find is a mistiming of the motion in the combination. So let's refer to, remember how we talked about how to listen to an observing lesson? This comes up a lot. When, where do you put the in and out motion in relationship to the rotation? So it does not happen on the preparatory motion. So the preparatory motion is pure. It happens on the motion back to play, so the playing motion. What happens very often is people are anticipating that out. So they do the preparatory motion and the body is already trying to get out. That disturbs the turning the turning will be completely corrupted, not because they don't know how to turn. Do you see? Well, I'm trying to save you time in a certain sense because going back to, to what you see all the time might take up a lot of time and also be very discouraging to somebody because it seems like you're going back to the same things. You know, When you get people out beyond the basic things, the work can become very exciting. They start to see cause and effect. They start to see results as a result of as means of advancing. They begin to become aware that they're, if they move this way, this feels better, that move, that passage is better. But it takes quite a bit to get there. So one of the things I wanted to say was watch out in the in, applying in the in and out in this direction that the person doesn't anticipate it. You know, they also, as they turn, they reach in. With the, with, with, they know they have to go in. So they're turning and the second finger is already reaching in. That could also be because the thumb has such an agenda to, to, to get on the keyboard twisted. So one of the, the important things, and Talvin used to, to get behind people, to, uh, Hector, do you mind if I show again? Talvin used to do this with the, with the in and out. She used to say to people, okay, first I want you to experience something. I want you to rotate, okay? And I want you to go in and out while rotating. So you give people this kind of very rough hewn experience. Remember, it's like a sculpture. You can't go to this big block of marble and carve out the ear. You gotta lop off what doesn't, big pieces of what doesn't belong there. You know, then you can get more refined. At first, you might spend, give the kid a week to just do this. Can they do this? You know, you'll see that if this is tight, you'll see if they come around like this. So you get, you get kind of something going. Get something on the table with the kid. Okay, great. And then what she used to do is hold people like this, okay, on both sides, very lightly. So play three, and now rotate to two, and rotate to the thumb. And she used to give them experience of what it is to go in straight, versus if the person's doing something like this. So that helps very much because they give Okay, thank you. Is that clear in terms of that? I wrote down a few things. Um, look, 
everybody has a different makeup of clientele that they're working with. Everybody's very earnest about helping people. Will a full job on every student that you ever see be possible? Probably not. This is pretty advanced. You know, it takes, it takes something. So there has to be some way for you to kind of have a way to determine is this, a, is this something helpful to the student or not? What I try to do is, um, in the background, it's not something I'm discussing with the student, I'm just kind of trying to figure out from whatever the student's saying to me or whatever, to evaluate my approach to helping them. Um, these are meant to help and not meant to lock the student into a category. I'm not suggesting you tell the student your assessment. Okay? Um, <laughs> I think it is important to assess their level of motivation. You know, if, if they are really carted there under duress, that's not a highly motivated experience. So you might want to adjust. You might want, not want to go gangbusters with that kid, you know? Um, what is their level of interest? You know, if they're really interested in music, you have a lot there that you can work with. If they're not so interested in music, that makes it more difficult. Not interested in piano, not just interest in general, whatever that means. Um, as a child, do they seem eager, quick, and bright? Um, try to evaluate how basically coordinated they are. You know, what, when, they, when you give them something simple to do with the piano, does their body take to it? Does it ignore it? Does it not experience it? Try to figure out, is this a person that's in touch, mind-body? Because you can't really start to teach the work unless you can teach them to have their mind and body communicate. It's a very interesting body of work. If I were to, to, to give one suggestion, the model that it looks like at the beginning is like a megaphone of the coach on the field. It's screaming to the players what to do next, right? And that, at the beginning, takes a lot of that what the directions in the head have to be so loud to the body for the body to respond. But the body becomes educated. It becomes subtle. And then you can, you can turn down the volume on the megaphone. You can start to suggest the body does this, suggest that. But I find that it's pretty common that the body needs quite a bit of dynamite in that area. It needs mental to physical dynamite. It's not waking up in the morning saying, oh, what do I get to communicate from my mind to my body today? It's trying to play the piano, period. It's trying to hear a little music, have a little fun, you know? So it's an educational process that takes a while, but you have to keep it in mind that you're, you are trying to get them involved in their own body, to have cause and effect within their own body. Um, if they're injured, you have to take a very... A cautious approach. You can't do things too fast, you can't do things in too much exaggeration. All of that has to be taken into consideration. It is important to evaluate if they're basically untrained um, or if they need basic musical skills because if you, you can't really put this work on top of somebody who has deficiencies in very, very basic skills. They're not reading, they're not counting. They're, these are important things that you have to address. So you try to do as much physical as possible, but realize that that's your scenario. You have a compromised scenario. It's not just technique. Um, are they strong emotionally or very, very sensitive? That can help you because some people won't respond to a very forceful situation. Some people need a little bit more TLC, you know, in, in the disseminating. Um, are they bored? Are they overwhelmed easily? That is something very easy to lose sight of because we're all eager to do a good job. I notice with myself, I have to pull back sometimes. I want to do so much more, but it's not going to help the situation. You, you start to see that the smoke's coming out of the ears, the eyes are rolling in the back of the head. It's just, it becomes overwhelming. So nothing is getting accomplished. So sometimes we can't tie it up in a bow every lesson. You know, sometimes you just have to put in what you feel you can get them to do. Making a note or writing it down, that's not, that's not complete yet. You know, I've got to revisit that. And leave it for another time. Sometimes people are just shy or nonverbal. And that doesn't mean they're not learning. So it's very important to, 
be sensitive to that aspect that sometimes people learn in a very nonverbal way. Sometimes showing them is much better than explaining, finding ways to show them. Um, I think it is important as a teacher to keep your eye out for anything that occurs as a learning disability. You know, if the person, if you're trying to teach them to read or to move in a certain way and there's just, you just feel like there's something else going on. It's important to know because if the person keeps having the experience of not doing something well, they tend to internalize it. And that's not so great for them. Um, the flip side of the coin. Do they seem assertive to the point of wanting to be the teacher? I'm sure you've all seen that. You know, they come in and they're really not listening to you. That's an educational process. They think it's good in their world. They think it's good. They think it's a good way to, be, to learn. You sometimes have to teach them what it is to be coachable. You know, if you're not coachable in this work, there's no platform to learn. And coachable looks like when the coach says to the group, we're turning left, the group turns left. It doesn't say, can we turn left after we go right for a little bit more? No, they turn left. And sometimes you have to find a way that the person can feel comfortable or free enough or safe enough to go with you. You're going to need a person to come with you along the corrections for this to be successful. The person has their own agenda and is unaware of it. It's going to be very, very difficult to, to make any kind of change. So I try to keep my, my eye out for that. Um, do they have healthy skepticism or outright argumentative? The healthy skepticism, here's how you know. They don't harp on it. They ask their question, they get an answer, and they move on. When they're really argumentative, they, they use the guise of skepticism, but they persist. So if something keeps persisting, I recommend having a conversation about you're there to help them, you know, you're not really think it's very good to, to have this kind of push and pull and debate over all the information. You know, in your opinion, this information has been around for more than 70 years. It's worked very well. There are a few videos I can send you to how people play. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to do it. Something. But if you get into the argumentative thing and debate the work, the work is not debatable because you'll always lose. I'll tell you, you'll always lose. Because from a logical point of view, you can poke holes in this stuff left and right because it doesn't make sense logically. Why do I turn right to play left? What's the, why would I do that? And how do you play fast? And why would I make a double rotation? That doesn't make any sense. It, it, it will go on and on, okay? You have to open up this idea that the success here has a different logic system. It has a biomechanical and physical logic system that we can't look to the things on paper and poke holes into because it won't work. There is a surrendering into the physicality of this that's necessary. Sometimes, you know, they can be very disrespectful, you know, with, that, and you can't learn in that uh, scenario. And the other thing is, do they have support at home for practicing and following up well? I think it's very helpful to create some mi minor, minor, minor structures for the kids, if the, you're teaching kids, to follow up and have something there. I'm sure you all do it but I just want to mention it. When you look at it from there, you can kind of get a sense of how fast should you go with this person. You know, without that, you might have your own idea of what they can do, but it might not be feasible. So you try to look for, for that. Um, so all of these factors may come, up into, may come into play in deciding when and how much material should be covered. Keep an eye out for that glazed donut look. Just stop, breathe, and share a funny story that ends well. <laughs> Always helps. <laughs> All right. Um, just have to take a look at what, what time. OK, it's 9 o'clock, so we, we've, we've completed. There's, this is yet another lecture. My purpose here, and maybe I will talk a little bit about it tomorrow, because we have some breathing room. So I, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I wanted to give you some possible ways for helping people bridge this moment from doing what you would say is kind of the, the five fingers in a scale and a test tube and going to music. You know, that there, there, are, there are certain ways I've found that help the process so that the, the, the engagement, remember I talked about the word engagement, remains there. 
So it takes, uh, when, when people do some of the things I'll talk about tomorrow, they find themselves as a byproduct extremely engaged. And from that engagement, they're actually experiencing the motions because the engagement causes the motions. Does that make sense? Versus trying to go to the piano, making sure you do the motions. You have to have certain motions there, in, in, indisputable. But having the motions there has not proven a complete slam dunk to internalizing it into a piece of music. And I think there are specific reasons for it. So I created some things which will help to bridge that gap, help people engage in such a way for a long enough time that the thing becomes a habit. Because if they actually do it this way, they will actually, will actually take a certain amount of time to do this correctly. They will actually be engaging in that. And that, in its essence, will give them the healthy kind of repetition to actually work it into their body. So we'll do that tomorrow. Okay? Any questions? Mm, yes, Hector. Um, you didn't talk about the point of sound. So is the point of sound something you would uh, implement in this part of the process? It's good that you brought it up. Where I would actually do the point of sound is literally in when you first drop. Mm -hmm. If the person really is going way, you know, past the point of sound, I would address it. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Yes, I think it's important because you can't get the right resting unless you consider the point of sound. So the point of sound is that bump, the escapement. You can't stop there, but you can't aim for the bottom. You're aiming for that point and it's falling to the bottom. What Taubin used to say is the best example would be the tennis ball's coming, the racket aims to the surface, it contacts with the tennis ball and there's a follow through. Everything after the contact is follow through. Mm -hmm. So everything after the point of sound is that falling feeling of the forearm where it just gets to the bottom of the key. Usually when you aim lower than the point of sound, it's forced. If you stop at the point of sound, it's hovered. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So yes, that can help very much. Okay, and one more, Darren. Uh, do you find it useful, I find it useful lately, to just address, uh, to, to acknowledge the difference of the height of the forearm, sometimes going from the short finger to the third, um, when you rotate. Like, when you rotate, they, they, they were doing everything right, but they said that when they are going from fourth to the third finger, they are not comfortable enough. I just ask them, are you... Are you realizing it's slightly, uh, are you letting your arm be as free as go a bit higher? And then it was sold. I don't know, it was... Okay, it brings up a very important point. So I want to make a, uh, um, a distinction here. I wouldn't teach that as a rule, okay? But here's where, it, where the context in which it's helpful. Realize that no component on its own is going to do the whole job. So nothing, in an essence, will feel completely comfortable unless the surrounding movements are, are happening. So somebody's rotation can only get so good until it's combined with the in and out, until it's combined with the walking hand and arm and it's combined with shaping. So absolutely, they must be very sensitive because most people from where they come from, turning, they wouldn't be able to differentiate that it felt that uncomfortable going from four to three. You have somebody a little bit more sensitive, so absolutely encourage the next. That's what in that they're helping you. They're actually giving you the information you need to start the next set of motion to be incorporated. I was and not sure. Just it, is it the right time? You know, like shall I wait or? Yeah, yeah. No, I think you have to. This is the point. This is the point of getting out of the linear thing. Like there are absolute steps. The person gave you it, and you went with it, and and you kind of got there. But, but can you see how that's different than telling people you should make sure when you're teaching the rotation to make sure they come three and I, that, that would be a little bit dangerous because that could complicate, that's, that's too, um, too many straws on the camel's back, you know, it just, oh, they won't learn anything. So there is this kind of giving it to people in digestible pieces so that they can be present to the correctness of it so you can build. Even if the person doesn't follow up well, Stay with something that you know you got them to do correctly. Mark it in your head or write it on a card and start from that place the next lesson. It is possible to teach people. I can tell you honestly, I've had people that I've taught to rotate, move in and out and integrate it into a piece of music 
who have come for a lesson and said, I have to talk to you. I have never practiced one thing you showed me. <laughs> By just putting them through the paces in an extremely rigorous way. I mean, it's been a hard work. I won't, I won't say it was easy. It was hard. It's, but it's like, it's like a carpet installment. It's like they, they said, install the carpet. I want to come back when the furniture's back. You know? So it's like taking their body and putting the thing in their body because I tracked it. I figured out exactly what I got them to do correctly. And when they came back and they had their sob story, I listened to it and then I said, okay, now we're gonna start right here. And I got that back and I added another little piece to it and they complained how they'll never play again, that's fine, but they keep coming back. So if they keep coming back, they're gonna get another little piece. And those pieces keep adding up and then there's this sort of critical mass of coordination and suddenly they're saying, oh, it feels so much better to play. But I've had a few people say, I've never practiced any of this at home. So that's how powerful, I want to tell you, that's how powerful the work is. If you can track it, if you can identify how to, how to get in there with somebody, you can get in and out, and they don't even think they really are rotating. Because you, you leave them with an experience of, of, of it being so much easier, right? When in the final analysis, they play and the experience is so much easier, and that's what they're present to, and that's what they care about. They don't care really if they get off the stage and they're able to tell you measure 44 had an incorrect double rotation on the third note. They don't care. So, so there, it is possible, but it is so much better when people come track with you, you know, and they're willing to do the pieces of something and build it with you. That's much, that's more ideal. But the work is extremely powerful because it has a natural pull inherent in it. See, it'd be very difficult to teach somebody very unnatural emotions and then not practice them and then be, really play that way. But, the, but the, the brain pulls toward the natural. So as if they're smart enough and they experience it and they're open, you can put it together. And I think that's basically what happens with kids. I doubt that the kids are going to go home and meticulously practice it. But if you're vigilant and you keep bringing them back and you keep giving that experience and you keep building it, they will... You know, and you'll see, you'll see a very good example. I can say it now because they're not here, but on Sunday, two, the two kids will play. And they're both very gifted, but Petrina is younger and she takes the work and she generates. She asks me questions. And Preston, he likes it, he likes to play, but he's not, he doesn't dig in. He doesn't pull the work toward him, okay? And there's a difference, you'll see that there's a difference. So that's the difference. I, I got Preston, you know, over the hump. But he didn't help me as much as she did. You know, she was like clockwork. She came back, she did, you know, and it went much faster. And then he watched his sister get a lot better. So that helped. <laughs> that helped a little bit. But you will have these varying paces, do you see? And we, in a way, we have to accommodate this thing without losing our own sense of what needs to be done and how we need to bring it forward. Does that help it? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, wonderful. We'll Thank see you, you tomorrow morning. You're welcome. <laughs>